Well, good afternoon, dear listeners. I've got one of my favourite people. I really enjoyed interviewing Joe last time. I don't know if you remember Joe, those that regularly listen, but Joe is a musical director. She's been doing sing-alongs on Zoom throughout the lockdown, which is great. And she helps uh, direct uh, musical productions locally. Her enthusiasm is infectious. Oh, <laughs> and she put me right. She modernised me with her music. <laughs> I she try, I she try. brought me I'm up to date by about 20 years. <laughs> and, and I wasn't quite as out of date as I thought, dear listeners, because I actually knew about uh, the six wives of Henry VIII. You can uh, never be up to date with modern musicals because there's stuff coming out all the time. Yeah. So you think you've got it covered and then next week there's something new. So what we're going to chat about today is a different topic, but we're also going to bring in some upbeat music, music aren't we, Joe? But what we're going to talk about is the topic of obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a label called OCD. And I know Joe has suffered with this and, and Joe has felt very frustrated that people have misconceptions yeah, about definitely. this label. I call it a label yeah. Yeah. that it frustrates you and you welcome the opportunity to tell people more about it Absolutely. over the yeah, radio. Definitely. Yeah. And to educate us, because many of us, including me, think OCD is an obsessive cleaning disorder and absolutely. you go around with a feather duster all day and a, and a cloth. And, yeah, and, absolutely, yeah. And the and amount of times you hear people going, oh, I'm a bit OCD and I've got to make sure that everything's all clean and everything's all lined up. And that's the biggest myth, I think, about, about the condition that there is. Do you want me to sort of talk about the condition first of all yes yeah, so, uh, just a just a little minute though because yeah. i just want to describe i'm talking to joe through zoom <laughs> and she's in the most delightful garden room uh i don't just to describe she's looking really cheerful she's got uh, a lovely room it's pine wooded room pine cladding isn't it and it okay. looks absolutely lovely it's perfect for acoustics mm -hmm. and it looks delightfully sort of uh comfortable and business-like at the same time and it is not obsessively tidy but not obsessively <laughs> untidy either it's a nice balance and it's got nice pictures on the wall yeah. and it's one of those nice garden rooms uh, so it's yeah. like three three of uh, the, the ceiling the walls are all pine wooded and then one wall is glass, which is where yeah. the, is the glass window and you come in and out through there. And it's yeah. lovely and light and friendly looking. And I love wood as well. It's slightly reminiscent of a wooden sauna, I guess. Uh, yeah, everybody loves, like, you in your sauna today. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm in your sauna, but it's freezing. But no. You can't. Really oh, no, wood is no, nice and Right next to my heater. Ah. Oh. Oh, okay. And, and Joe shares the room with her husband because her husband works from home and, mm -hmm. and they have half the room each and they seem to get on really well. They're an amazing couple. They get on better than anybody else I know. <laughs> They're a team because he's yeah. looking after the children whilst Joe's chatting to me, which I'm so impressed about. You're a real team. You're yeah, a dream team, team, you two. Oh, bless you. But no, it's it's parenting. It's what parenting is about. Yeah, so, it's sharing, take, it. isn't it? Yeah, it's how, how it should be these days. So, and he's very calm and very good natured. I've noticed. You know, uh, I bet the girls mm. love him, and that your yeah, girls seem him. really enthusiastic and li live life to the full as well, which is nice. Yeah, yeah they do. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> <laughs> to the point of exhausting mummy and daddy sometimes. Yes, but Absolutely. But you're absolutely. doing a good job of your parenting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's always nice to have because, yeah, you don't always feel that way, do you? No, you put a nice notice, um, dear listeners. Joe put a notice up in her window pretending she'd been Ofsted inspected during the lockdown. <laughs> I think it said and she nice only gave try. herself one star. Yeah, it said nice try. I was yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. My 
she so, put an Ofsted's inspection notice in her window. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was good sense of humour. I liked it. I liked it a lot because all these schools, but we're outstanding. And 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 Joe and her husband were self-deprecating and saying. I can touch when we get to the serious point. I'll actually I can touch on that actually. Parenting. Oh, good. So that all links in. So I'm not going off on a random. Yeah. So no, back to OCD, really it makes me feel very uncomfortable talking about OCD, which might be my distraction technique. So let's back, let's talk back to OCD. Mm -hmm. What frustrates you then? The, the public think it's about cleaning and what what is OCD about, Joe? What is it really about? Right, so it's really important to sort of lay out, first of all, that everybody's experience of OCD is going to be slightly different and everybody's obsessions are going to be slightly different and people's um, compulsions are going to be slightly different. So I'm going to be talking uh, today about my experience and it might differ from someone else who's got uh, OCD as well. And that's really important to, to just to point out when we begin with. So for an OCD person, the best way to put it is if you're driving down the road I don't know, you see a little old lady at the side of the road and a thought might come through your head, if I just swivel my car, I could hit that old lady. And and that thought will go out your head and you'll start thinking about something else. For an OCD person, what will happen is that they will have a thought like that thought and think, oh my goodness, I thought that I was going to kill that old little old lady. That means I must, that is my intent. I need to stop that happening. And that's when the compulsions come in. So the compulsions, they're actually neutralizing behaviors. And that's where a lot of the cleaning comes from. Um, because some people with OCD will try and neutralize their thoughts by doing a compulsion of cleaning. It's also why some people count, if I count to 10, before I leave uh, the house, then my mother's not going to die or, or something like that. Now, not every compulsion is physical. Some of the compulsions are internalized, they're mental compulsions. And that's what I have. So I have something called pure O OCD, which I think also possibly George Ezra has, because um, he's spoken about his OCD. So my compulsions are physical so I don't need to do something a certain amount of times so I don't have any physical rituals but I have in the past used a lot of mantras in my head to neutralize those thoughts and the difference between someone who is just clean and someone with OCD is that someone who likes being clean they just like things being clean and organized for an OCD person, if they don't do that compuls compulsion to them, something terrible is going to happen. And that's the difference, is there's a tremendous fear when you're in the complete grip of OCD, that if I don't do this, this is gonna happen. If I can't neutralize this thought, it's going to happen. And it's actually, when you're in the middle of it, it's incredibly scary and it can, where during my worst and i haven't been my worst for for years and i thank god for that in your worst you can't function you can't sleep you can't eat you just are paralyzed with these terrifying thoughts and you could come back to me and say well you just just don't don't think them then don't have you know just say i don't want to think that but actually if you say if i said to you i don't want you to think about cheese what what are you thinking about now bernie cheese <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. absolutely so if you say to someone well, just don't think about that well they're going to think about it. if you tell yourself don't think about this don't think about this immediately you're going to be thinking about it um so can i can so, i give a sort of an example for example so yeah. so if i go down a particular road i might start yeah. thinking i'm going to crash into that wall yeah so every time i drive down that road i'm thinking i'm going to crash into that wall so I think I don't want to drive down that road anymore. I'm going to go a different way to work. Is that a yeah, sort it, of cut compulsive yeah, thought? It, yeah, it could be that you, your compulsion is to go such a long way around to avoid that. Or you might have a neutralising behaviour. So, for example, I must make sure that I've got a certain song or I'm wearing 
a certain hat or you know it it, it, it the compulsion could be anything oh, right. and, and they don't make sense to oh, the, yeah. like it's just to a lay person looking in you'll be like so it can what? be quite random because I, I did feel that uh, this fright of crashing into the wall, actually, I, I remember years ago and I used to drive this particular way to work and I don't know where it came from, but I don't think I took any particular action about it. I just mm -hmm. felt uncomfortable, if that makes sense. But yeah. maybe that was the beginnings. It could well be. And, and we don't know necessarily what, what causes um, so what? of uh, OCD just to help us get a grip of it practical example 
So is it like uh, you think you're going to be unlucky if you don't wear your particular shoes one day, that you got to wear your lucky shoes? Is it so, something like that? It, that you yeah, must wear it, your it, lucky it, shoes, otherwise you're going to fail your exam or something? Or Yeah, it, it starts with the obsession. So the obsession normally is a thought that the, you could be obsessed with getting perfect marks at school. And right. the only way you're going to get perfect, and that, but the obsession has to become all consuming. It's not oh, just right. saying, I really want to do well at school. It's to the point where you can't oh, get see. something out of your head. So that's, that's a very, very good example, isn't it? That you must do well at school and everything, uh, nothing else becomes important. It just yeah. takes over. So I, mean, I could be for, obsessed with my local radio work and uh, uh, to the <laughs> to everything else, exclusion of yeah. everything else. And, and but yeah. I mean, you would if 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 you were an OCD person, it would be if you don't get this done, if that would be your pure obsession, you know, terrible things are going to happen, right. and your level of of anxiety. I mean, other examples right. are... This is um, really helpful, Joe, because it's explaining... Yeah. This is very, very helpful because it, it's kind of explaining what it is, that dreadful things will happen. Yeah, that, uh, it, it's that, that, that irrational, yeah. irrational um, thoughts, almost. Yeah, that, and it, and it, yeah, and it might not be, oh, I'm going to kill somebody. It, it, it could be... You know, any, any anything, the house might fall down or, yeah. um, you know, or it, it's... And, and to a, so there's a I fine line like, between rational and irrational, isn't there? Absolutely. But it's interesting uh, because we can all get a bit obsessed with a person or we can obsess with a particular job that we're doing or a task. And, and it's where it goes over that line. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's, an when you're in the middle of it and you don't know your condition, which is what happened to me, so I'm getting these obsessive thoughts which are incredibly intrusive and I'm still not at the point where I can talk about them. Yeah. Um, so I won't go into detail because it's still too distressing. Yeah. But you get to the point where you... And you just think, so I'm, going, I'm going mad. I'm going mad. Yeah. I'm absolutely terrified. I can't function. On earth, why are these thoughts coming into my head? Why can't I get rid of them? I'm trying to do my mantras and nothing's happening. And it, it is terrifying and it's completely debilitating yeah. when you're in the middle of it. And I, I was kind of thinking, and I, I think I've voiced this before with you, is there's a bit of an overlap with other conditions, with uh, such as anxiety. A, a lot of us get afflicted with anxiety a lot and sleepless nights again through anxiety and worry and stress and, and there's a bit of a, a blend there a bit of a crossover isn't there of the two yeah yeah so I suffer from anxiety as well it's funny what you're saying about my husband and he won't mind me uh, sharing this with you um but he has anxiety as well he he takes antidepressants because he um, suffers from anxiety he's amazingly supportive to me but um, we lost his father uh, three years ago, bless him. And, so, you know, and, and that's that stress and that anxiety. So he suffers from anxiety as well. And it's really important that we can give these conditions a name because before I had, you know, I just thought I was going mad or as an evil person or as a terrible, terrible person. Yeah. And the day that my psychiatrist, and I can tell you, I was at Hartford County Hospital, the day that he named my condition was amazing because I could yeah. suddenly research the condition. I found forums, support groups. I knew what it was and I could name it. And so yeah. when the intrusive thoughts came through, I could, that is my OCD. That's not me being a bad yeah. person. That's not me being go, going mad. That's my OCD. It's like with anxiety. Okay, I recognise mm. that's my anxiety. And obviously with that has to uh, come treatment. But maybe we should have some music first. And maybe we oh, should yes. this me from The Greatest Showman. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, let me write this down. Say it again. Yeah. Uh, this is me. Oh, this is me. Show. Okay. Yeah. 
Right, we'll have This Is Me right now, Joe. That's lovely. So I know a lot of my listeners love The Greatest Showman, Joe. That was a great choice. You chose that at that moment because you're saying you are coming to terms with This Is Me, that I uh, understand what I'm about. And I know, I'm sure listeners can relate to when they have an illness and they don't know what it is and the anxiety and all of that. And then when they go and see their doctor, they say, oh, you've got so-and-so. When you know you've got so-and-so, you you feel much better, What whatever it is, you know, that kind of... Oh, anxiety about what on earth's going on. I relate a little story to you um, that you can share with your husband that all the listeners can hear. But when I was at uh, probation, I got a bit burnt out. And uh, part of that dynamic of being burnt out was anxiety, pure anxiety, I guess. Uh, feeling out my depth and not being able to cope very well and, and with the changing world and uh, from being an old fashioned practitioner to to and different pressures in that the dynamic was that we were becoming more computer based and more assessment based where I was more creative and more motivational in my work. Mm. Uh, there was a big tension of me being asked to do a lot of assessment computer based work when I wanted to, really my heart was in motivational work uh, with people. Oh, yeah. So uh, there was a tension there and things just got too much for me. And, yeah. and I got and. Uh, one day I swore at my line manager and said really rude, horrible words. And But rather than discipline me uh, or take me to task or take a grievance out, which many people would have done, mm-hmm. uh, my manager was very insightful and had me go to the uh, occupational health. Mm-hmm. And uh, we chatted through and we realised that throughout my life had been a tendency 
for insecurity and anxieties, uh, quite a pattern of them that haven't that I kind of just about managed with over the years. So they they helped me with that, and um, I had other conditions such as uh, very high blood pressure, mm-hmm. and I had gallbladder trouble as well, uh, and I had to have my gallbladder removed, but. If it hadn't been for the kindness of my line manager at the time, uh, uh, goodness, I might not be in really good shape because high blood pressure is really dangerous. Uh, You can have a stroke or you can have heart trouble or whatever. So that alone, so that was a great kindness. So I'm kind of sharing this with everybody that that basic kindness towards others is so important, isn't it? That Christianity, if you like, uh, the, or just being decent towards each other is so absolutely. important, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's about yeah. giving people the benefit of the doubt. We're so often kind of so ensconced in what's going on in our heads that we don't even think about what's going on in other people's boats. You know, yeah. we don't, what's driven yeah. them to that that decision what's driven them to that yeah. decision don't, yeah. doesn't he even cross our mind half the time yeah so that manager was so kind uh, mm. in having me assessed it, it's just wonderful wasn't it it's so what's next after the this is me the great show what do you want to talk about next right i think the next thing is just to talk about uh treatment really right. yeah um and uh, and um, for OCD, I was completely blessed to be able to get something called cognitive behavioural therapy on the NHS. Now, that is not something that everybody can get. You know, cuts have made it much more difficult to get what we call CBT and counselling and things like that. My CBT that I had after my diagnosis changed my life completely it's what i needed now cbt doesn't work for every person with ocd and there are other treatments but for me it gave me the tools to manage my condition Mm. um the other thing i need to always remember is that it's like if i had diabetes i'd take insulin so for me um my mind doesn't always work properly i have this condition so i probably will always be on some sort of antidepressant just to make sure that my mood is level so i'm on an antidepressant and i probably will be for the rest of my life and that is fine because if i had another condition like high blood pressure i'd be taking something for that yeah the other thing now as i manage my life and it's very interesting because before we started recording this we were talking about pressures and taking on too much Mm. i have to very carefully manage what i do So I tend to work as a singing teacher in the evenings um, and after school and with my MD work as well. So I have to make sure in the daytime I have time to rest um, and realise that actually I need to make sure that I have plenty of rest. I have to have plenty of sleep. When my mind as an OCD person is constantly assessing things planning things it doesn't switch off so i get very tired and i do have naps in the day because i need to have that to be able to function for the rest of the day and it's recognizing that in in me um i've been very lucky i've got a wonderfully supportive husband who's Mm -hmm. able to work full time and so i work around him but it's been a painful lesson to say no but i've had to you have to learn it and also exercise yes exercise is very important so i do pilates regularly and i make sure i try and walk the dog uh nearly every day so there is something about exercise that release of endorphins that is so important for someone with a mental health condition and obviously the last thing you want to do when you're feeling anxious and is go outside but actually yeah. if you can make that step and just take a little walk just to the end of the road it will make a tremendous difference i have a song by the proclaimers you probably it's 500 miles oh yes and it just makes me smile this song yeah. makes me smile i've done it in pantomime and there i don't know something so positive about this song yeah. so maybe we Listen to that, 500 miles. Yes. Can I expand on a couple of little points before Please. we play your song? Yeah. 
Okay. Is that all right? Um, I, I just want to expand on the point that you made that how reassuring it was for you to connect with other people in the same sort of condition and, and to learn tips from each other and, and your carers and things like that. I, I think that's enormously reassuring once you've got your diagnosis and to network with other people. So if, if yeah. anybody is listening has got OCD and is a parent, there is a fantastic OCD parent support project on Facebook that you can join and it's run by it's not ocd people supporting other ocd people it's run by professionals so that's really important and um, the other thing is that the ocd community on twitter believe it or not is one of the most supportive communities i've 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 discovered so i've got a number of twitter friends who oh, that's lovely support each other yeah yeah so because they're there all the time and you can make friends through Twitter, actually, can't you? Right. Yeah. You, I mean, you've got to be careful because there are, well, on any yeah, social media. a bit media, addictive, can't it, going on? That, that's the problem, isn't it, I guess? Um, the other bit I just want to expand on this or, or to underline is how wonderful your partner's been and how understanding he, he is. I think, I think that's a godsend, isn't it, how understanding he is? Because not always partners are, are they? Especially since yeah. he has struggled, this sounds terrible, he struggled with his mental health. So he now understands a little bit yeah. about what I'm going through. Yeah. And we've been able to support each other. I know that and uh, the older generation, that sounds terrible, don't always get anxiety and things. It's kind of that stiff upper lip that will yeah. pull yourself together. And, and, and th yeah, with the older members of my family, that's maybe been a little bit more difficult but they are coming round to the idea yeah the cognitive behavioral thing i was very interested in because having been a probation officer i know that we would try and do cognitive behavioral work with offenders and found it quite useful mm. uh, the one thing we did find a uh, really useful with people with addictions was getting them to do exercise and to go to the gym and that positive endorphins thing was, uh, and for them to do an activity where they can see themselves making progress, mm. uh, a little bit of progress, whatever they you know want to achieve, that they can do this better, or or they've got, or they're losing a little bit of weight, or they're doing this, or they're breathing better, or 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 they're getting a positive endorphin out of doing the physical activity. So I love the proclaimers as well because. Uh, I've even done seated exercise with the elderly people in the care homes. And this is one of my favourites. And I get them marching in their chairs to I will walk fight, and waving their arms up and down. So it's quite a motivational one. So we're connecting, Joe. So I want you to introduce the song, uh, why it's um, good for you and the name of it and who it's by. And uh, we'll play it right uh, now. Raise your voices. Doesn't matter, no one's listening, and just enjoy 500 Miles by the Proclaimers. Lovely. Well done. When I wake up, well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you. When I go out, yeah, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who goes along with you. If I get drunk, well I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who gets drunk next to you. And if I heaver, yeah I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who's heavering to you. But I would walk 500 miles and I would walk 500 more to be the man who walked a thousand miles to fall down at your door. When I'm I'm gonna be the man who's working hard for you And when the money comes in for the work I do I'll pass almost every penny on to you When I come home, when I come home oh, I know I'm 
I think even 15 years ago, people didn't understand different mental health conditions. Um, and so when I presented with these symptoms, I was just completely misdiagnosed, sent to this counsellor, told to do this. And actually that did more harm than good. Did, how did you find the counselling? Was it helpful or unhelpful? So the, the counselling I had the first time was really unhelpful. But when I had my big OCD breakdown, when I just stopped functioning, which was about nine, nine and a half years ago, um, I went to see a counsellor straight away. And that being able to talk about what was going on in my head and being able to verbalise was really important because there's something when you verbalise what's going on, it's almost like a weight's being taken off, you know, to actually say, I'm thinking this or I'm struggling or this is going on. Yeah. And at the start, we were talking about parenting. And I just said, I just don't feel like I'm a good enough um, parent. And, and he said something to me, which has stuck with me. And this might be really helpful um, to some of your listeners. There's no such thing as a per perfect parent. Don't strive for perfection. You're never going to get it. But there is, you are always going to be a good enough parent. And I just think that you are good enough. You're a good mm. enough parent. I think that's so important. And that's something that I keep with me now. It's like a little life raft enough. sort of thing, a mental life raft. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Not to put yourself down. Yeah. You are good enough. And I think, you know. I'm interested as well by, by the, because I found some counsellors can be a bit like talking to a brick wall where they're completely unresponsive they're, or they're talking to a mirror, I suppose, and they're reflecting back yourself to yourself and you got to, supposed to work yourself out yeah and as a probation officer I wasn't like that I was more of a guider a motivator more warm empathetic all those sort of things and some counselors you some I don't know it's the way they're trained or the way they work you don't feel that they're particularly kind or what uh, no warmth about them or I don't know if that's what you experience but and then some counts are absolutely fantastic and helpful and kind and supportive and listening. So it's just if you have a connection with your counsellor, if it works, it works, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think for them it's finding the balance because they obviously don't want to lead their clients no, in any yeah. direction. It has to come from the client. But I think some counsellors are better enablers, enabling yeah. you to yeah. do that maybe that other. Whereas I, I didn't mind being more of a leader and a pusher. My role was probation officer. I think that was appropriate, really. I, I suppose our job was to enable people to do stuff but mm -hmm. and not to do it for them. But certainly if we could shove them in the right direction, there was no harm in that, I feel. You no. know. Whereas counsellors would be reluctant to shove people. But I would yeah. verbally shove people in the right direction. And sometimes we'd say ridiculous things just to make people think. We'd use all sorts of techniques. But one of them was saying something outrageous just to make the person think, you know, about what they were... Yeah, like parenting, really, isn't yeah. it? Get the children to make their own mistakes, but at the same time, you're just like, please don't do that. But OK, I'm trying to give you some freedom, off you go. Yeah, they're so enthusiastic, your children. Um, I wanted to encourage people. Yeah, if you're feeling at a point where you're really anxious, you know, you're maybe you can't you know eat or you these 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 are emotions because we're in really difficult times at the moment but if things are going on that that just don't feel right be able to talk about it verbalize it and i'm not a medical practitioner but i would always say go to your gp you know they want to help you they will listen um we're really lucky locally with with our gp services i think but if you're really struggling talk to your gp get help don't suffer in silence yeah because the gp service want to hear from you something i used to help my service users with was that they would find it hard to articulate sometimes whatever was going on to their gp so I actually i used to sit and write letters with them mm -hmm. of whatever was going on and we'd send it in in advance of the appointment and and before the gp would quickly have a look at this little note that we'd send in and and that was very 
helpful actually with little sensitive issues to, and and it gave the time for GPs to think about whatever was going on for that person before they even came for their appointment. And I think they quite like that approach. So me as a practitioner, I used to do that kind of thing. And I remember how, I remember I had a chap, he had kind of paranoia and it was a sort of compulsive thing. And it, it's funny how all these kind of things overlap, but often at the bottom of the story is a grain of truth, that there was a grain of truth in his story. And it, that grain of truth became completely overwhelming and irrational and compulsive. So he, what it was, was he was a great, big, huge man who was an absolute gentle giant. And, and, and I think he had slight learning difficulties. And these Criminals used him because of his size, that he looked menacing with a stocking on his head. And, and they used him to uh, go and they did um, a robbery of a post office. And when he was caught by the police, he and he opened up to the police and told them absolutely everything, all the names of everybody and, and all of that. So when he went to court and he was standing at the Crown Court or whatever, they said to him, your life ain't going to be worth living anymore. You, we know what you've done. We know you told the police. You're going to be, we're going to get you. And, and they were really nasty and menacing to him. And he never forgot that. So he was exceptionally frightened when he was in prison. And the actual prison officers took note of this and were very kind to him in that they gave him special duties of cleaning the officer's mess every day and all the hallways and things like that. And he never really came into much contact with the other prisoners. And that was a way of them protecting him. And uh, when he came out, his, now get this, was very kind, because people were kindly towards him. His ex-partner, his ex-wife's dad gave him a job, which I thought was amazing. So even though he's divorced from his wife, his father-in-law gave him a job and it was, and I said, what do you do? And he was helping building conservatories and extensions and things like that. And he said, my job, I'm the gopher. And I said, what's a gopher? And he said, well, can you go for some cement down at the, can you jump in the van and go for some cement and bricks? <laughs> <laughs> so he used to do that. But the problem was he used to take a really long time going backwards and forwards to the wholesalers, the mm -hmm. builders because he thought there were all these criminals following him that were out to get him. And he saw all these cars and he'd take all these weird routes to and from, and he'd get back to work. And they say, well, how come that's a 10 minute journey? It took you half an hour when it's only 10 minutes away. What's all that about? How come you were, have you got a girlfriend that you called in and, and things like that. And, um, it was a real struggle to get him accommodation, but his father-in-law helped him get a little bed sit. But unfortunately, it was a ground floor one, and he felt really unprotected there. And he kept hearing noises during the night, and he kept calling the police. And the police got so annoyed that they were threatening him with um, wasting their time and all of this. And, uh, and he was having these weird thoughts that... Um, or he was worried that they are out to get him, and all these cars were following him and all that... And, uh, and the police began to realise it was completely fantasy what was going on in his head. So from that original true bit, everything had got out of, blown out of proportion. And often mental health issues are that kind of thing, aren't they? And he got so bad that he'd stopped eating, you know, and he lost a lot of weight. The help that he needed in the end. I think he, yeah, we got there. I had to liaise with GPs and psychiatric services, but it used to, it was quite difficult in those days. Yeah. Um, so it's the same goes with mental health is that professionals really need to ensure they all communicate with each other, that we let the GPs know what's going on or we let the psychiatrists know um, because they, they can't always just base an assessment on a quick chat with somebody. Yeah. But if they got the full all the behaviours that are going on. Um, I had a case like that where this man was strangely building shrines in the housing office. and um... Yeah, there, there are some people that are struggling with some really, really tough times. And I'm that, that level of, of psychiatric disease, I know there are people really struggling. And I think 
the healthcare workers and the practitioners are doing an amazing job with with the resources that they've got which let's be honest aren't enough yeah they're the it, poor relation of the nhs aren't they the mental health you know i think something's got got to give i, I think some of the way that we live the way that we think about each other the way we treat each other has a a lot to do with with the rise in, in mental health um as well i think we put ridiculous pressure on ourselves to be perfect to to be perfect parents you know living our lives on social media and i think that we have to almost take a step back from that and actually look at what is important and i think for some people this lockdowns help them to do that and i i really hope that that has a positive impact on on people because yeah. we don't need to be perfect who cares what other people think you know, I don't want to judge myself from Mrs. Bloggs down down the road. I am who I am. Yeah, I like that. And I know a lot of young girls really struggle with, uh, they feel they've got to look like lots of makeup and lots of this and lots of that and worry. And, and they don't need all that really very often. No. They don't need it. I mean, we're beginning to change about body image, but we've got so much, so much further to go. Yeah. But... And I think people have been lonely through lockdown, haven't they? And they miss. Really? Yeah, I, I, I think as well, some relationships, I think domestic violence has been on the increase, sadly, as well, through people being pressurised together, not being able to get out and things like that. But yes, I think a little bit more kindness in the world and understanding. And I hope this little radio show today has helped people understand. You know, my little story about that man, how. Often there's a grain of truth, but how the irrational kind of takes over and, and literally he saw everybody as a threat, that there are all these criminal gangs following him around. But of course it was completely untrue and, and not even the highest security services have so many cars following this dumper truck that he was driving, you know, that often these mental health issues start with a rational thought, but it just gets blown out of proportion. And it's a bit like that with compulsive disorder as well, isn't it? So they're often all interrelated, aren't they? And anxiety. Yeah. And... So let's finish on a nice, positive, cheerful note. I tell you, I, let me let me just say a few little positive things. I think men are becoming a bit more helpful. I've seen lots of men pushing prams around, which you never used to see. And I've noted a lot of women are stepping forwards in their professions, and uh, we're now getting more female architects, which is lovely. Uh, there are more female GPs under the age of 34 than there are male GPs now. Uh, after the war, they were like 0% in 1945 were female GPs. So we're, we're making progress. People are stepping forwards and we're starting to be a bit more helpful to each other and understanding, I'm hoping. And, and there's lots of support for men out there who are struggling with mental health. And men so especially. So, and you know, suicide is awful isn't it we need to really tackle that as a society and yeah try and understand what the problem's about and why it's happening and what can we do but the first thing is to help let's all give each other a bit more time and listen to each yeah. other a bit more and be supportive and don't you think joe that that's yeah. our message to the listeners uh, a bit more I mean, it's, it's that simple be kind isn't it i mean be it's kind. so simple it sounds so simple and yeah. That, yeah that's all it is just be kind yeah so last song what about i'm still standing by elton john <laughs> absolutely that's a nice one you can never know what it's like your blood like when a freezer just like there's a cold and lonely light that shines from you You wind up like the wreck you hide Behind that mask you use And did you think this fool could never win? Well look at me, I'm coming back again I got a taste of love in a simple way And if you need to know while I'm still standing You just fade away Don't you know I'm still standing Better than I ever did Looking like a true survivor Feeling like a little kid And I'm still standing After all this time Picking up the pieces of my life Without you on my mind I'm still standing Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm still standing 
This is Bernie here, and we've come to the end of the show. So I just want to thank you all very, very much for listening. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to Mickey Go Cool for having me on his radio station, and a huge thank you uh, to Joe for explaining her condition to us. It's been really helpful. And we're going to play out now with a lovely tune from King Crimson, I Talk to the Wind. It's the instrumental version of the song.